Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. I, as always, am your host, Simon, and what we have today is Catherine Knight, Australia's female Hannibal Lecter. With these, I'm like, you know, Casual Criminalist, it's a true crime show. We're mostly going to cover men. <laughs> and in this case, I'm totally okay with, like, the, uh, the criminal thing being less gender diverse, because when it comes to crazy crimes, it does tend to be men who do most of the killing and uh totally cool with i mean obviously it's bad but it's not like one of those cases where it's like simon you should uh represent more women on the channel uh can you cover more women serial killers bit really <laughs> that's how we want to do it but today well if you're that person you're welcome because i'm assuming catherine knight is a woman i'm assuming that because i've never read this script what happens here if you're new is callum puts me together a script got a nice hefty one right here and then i shall read it i'm going to add a few comments and thoughts if i have any i usually do maybe people will complain and then afterwards jen our wonderful video editor is going to add some, and also audio editor and adds she's going to add some music she's going to add some images if you're watching this as a youtube show if you're listening to the podcast well you just get to enjoy the music it's uh it's it, it's how things work you're familiar with the audio visual medium let's jump into it Early morning on the 1st of March 2000, relatively re relatively recent. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, 2000 wasn't that long ago. It's not, except it was. I was 13 and uh, it's 21 years ago, which is crazy. Uh, 1st of March 2000, the manager at a mining firm in the small Australian town of Aberdeen noticed that John Price, one of his best employees, hadn't turned up for work. That was extremely out of character for the usually punctual Price, so one of his co-workers was sent out to check on the missing man. Whispers spread around the office that something terrible might have happened to him, the sort of thing he often joked about. If I don't show up for work tomorrow, it's probably because she's murdered me. Oh my god. The woman he was referring to was his own partner, Catherine Knight. <laughs> If I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm not here, my wife killed me, ah, ah. But if my wife was actually, if I actually thought my wife could kill me, I probably wouldn't make those jokes. <laughs> It'd be a bit too close to home, wouldn't it? And I say joked, but recently it seemed less like a bit of harmless humor and more like an ominous warning. So it went from, yeah, 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 I'm not going to be at work tomorrow. If I'm not here, my wife killed me to be like, Michael, if I don't come to work tomorrow, my wife has murdered me. It's just a different vibe, isn't it? Everyone knew that Kathy had an explosive temper, but over the past month, it seems like she was really losing it. Just two days prior, Pricey had run to a neighbor's house to escape after she swung a butcher's knife in his face and threatened to slash him. Holy sh Everyone had told him to get the hell away from her after that, especially after their conflicting reports meant the police never even arrested her. Kathy was still free to torment him, so maybe she came back to finish the job. I mean, look, even if this had never happened, even if this was, you know, just, you know, She'd never come at him with a butcher's knife. She didn't famously have a short temper. Look, we know we've we've listened to enough true crime. We've seen enough CSI to be like, in this case, it's always the wife. You know, normally it's always the husband, because as we talked about in the intro of today's episode, <laughs> men are more murdery. Uh, but in this case, it's always the wife, isn't it? That was what was on the co-worker's mind as he pulled up in front of John's house at 84 St. Andrew Street that Tuesday morning to find the AWOL miner's car still sitting in the driveway. A next-door neighbor had also noticed that John wasn't up and about as usual that day, and the two men worked together to check in on him. They circled around to the side of the house to knock on Pricey's bedroom window. No response. So they decided to try the front door. It's a bit of a weird way to do it. <laughs> it's like, feels very teenage. Like, yeah, sneak around the back and knock on the bedroom window. It's like, we're, we're adults. Just knock on the front door. As they got close, they noticed something strange on the handle. A dark, reddish-brown stain. Holy shit. It was unmistakable. Dried blood smeared onto the metal. So they called the police. Good. You made the right move. As they waited for the cops to arrive, two men wondered about what might be waiting behind that door. No matter how bad they imagined the situation to be at that moment, the reality would prove infinitely worse. Oh, I get the feeling that in Callum's intro today, that we've skipped right ahead to the end and this is the moment when she gets caught and then we're going to discover some crazy, like she's got some sort of crazy torture Hannibal Lecter style dungeon going. Did Hannibal Lecter have a dungeon? I don't remember, but uh, this gonna, it's going to be horrible. How exciting. <laughs> Welcome to the casual criminal list. Behind that bloodstained door was one of the most gruesome, brutal, shocking crime scenes in Australian history. Fair warning, today's big finale is enough to test the stomach or even the most jaded true crime aficionado. This is the story of Catherine Knight, Australia's female 
Hannibal Lecter. And this is one of those episodes, whenever we do a particularly brutal episode, or even when we don't, like this, as I mentioned at the beginning, this podcast, YouTube, it also goes out on YouTube as like a YouTube show. And uh, YouTube get to decide whether something's monetized or not. So whether it's advertiser friendly, <laughs> spoiler alert, casual criminalist, not, it's like almost everyone is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not suitable for most advertisers. Not suitable for most advertisers. It's a bit depressing because obviously I, I like making money off the stuff I make. But I mean, it does all right. But it's, uh, yeah, YouTube's a bit savage when you make a show about horrific murder. Who would have thought it? Let's move on. The ones that got away. Close calls for David Kellett. In the small town of Aberdeen, New South Wales, Catherine Knight was well known for her instability. The nicest person in the room one moment and a slasher film villain the next. In many ways, her entire life was defined by a series of insane, abusive relationships. It started with her first husband, a local man named David Kellett, who she met while working at the Aberdeen Abattoir in 1973. By the way, I don't know why abattoir is such a great word. It just, for somewhere that's so horrible, is that what happens in an abattoir? It's like, oh yeah, that's where we murder animals to consume their flesh. Oh, good. Uh, when she was still a teenager, truck driver David was a heavy drinker, a fact attributed to the trauma of watching his best mate die in a rail yard accident at his prior job. Being a heavy drinking truck driver? Probably not a brilliant combination. He and Kathy married after just one year, despite the warnings from the bride's own mother about the kind of things she was capable of. Holy sh! If your bride's mother is being like, watch out for that one, are you sure you want to marry her? Just, uh, just, you know, consider that a point to be like, have a think you know the very first time she met david his future mother-in-law told him you better watch this one or she'll f kill you stir up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're f don't ever think of playing up to her cheating on her she'll f kill you oh my god <laughs> that i'd be like okay thanks for the advice mother of this person <laughs> good lord not one for the wedding speech, definitely not. And apparently it never phased Dave that much. He still went through with the wedding. But it didn't take long for Kathy's Mr. Hyde to show itself. On their wedding night, David woke up to find his new bride throttling him by the neck. He managed to shove her off and asked in a rasp voice what the hell she was doing. She screamed that he had only managed to go three rounds when consummating the marriage and she wasn't satisfied. Holy shit. Jesus Christ, if it only managed one, the poor guy probably wouldn't have seen the morning. Probably a good time to start stocking up on those little blue pills. That is insane. <laughs> <laughs> After that rocky start to their life together, Kathy's outbursts basically became part of their day-to-day -day routine. David described his wife as unpredictably violent even though he never fought back. I never raised a finger against her, not even in self-defense. I'd just walk away. Good for you, David. And I expect that's what most people would do. Because most people, I feel, are not abusive and crazy. And like, if a woman, like, if a guy hits me, honestly, I'm a bit of a coward. I'm probably not going to fight back. <laughs> But if a woman hits me, you don't hit a woman back. You just don't do that. If anything, like, restrain her, like, grab her arms and be like, so she can't hit you more. But you don't hit back as a dude. You just don't. <laughs> A huge part of Kathy's complex revolved around infidelity. If she even slightly suspected her man of cheating, her first instinct was to hack and slash. Another night not too long into their marriage, he woke up to find Kathy with her knee on his chest, pinning him down. In her hand was one of their most prized possessions, a butcher's knife from her abattoir set, which she kept hung above their marital bed. She held it against his neck. Oh my god, this is so psycho! What are you doing? What's, what's that above your bed? Oh yeah, it's a set of knives from when I worked in an abattoir as a teenager because I just f***ing loved slicing the animals' throats. What is wrong with you? I don't even know if that's what knives are used for in an abattoir, but I get the feeling the answer's probably that I'm right. You see how easy it is, Kathy said. Is it true that truck drivers have different women in every town? Even if David did have a bit on the side, that would have been a supremely awful time to break the news. He denied that he was having an affair, and Kathy pulled the blade away from his neck. She was placated for now, but that extreme jealousy would almost be the death of David. 
Is it true that truck drivers have the the alcoholic truck driver? He's got a woman in every town. One evening in 1976, he was out at a darts tournament with his friends and managed to get through to the final. This meant staying a little later than usual to see the competition through, which shouldn't have been a problem. But back at home, Kathy, who was heavily pregnant with their first kid, flew into a paranoid rage. She took all of her husband's clothes and shoes, slashed them to ribbons, and burned them in the garden. David, mate, you need to get the f out. Then, when David eventually stumbled through the door past midnight, she flew at him with a frying pan, smashing it into the back of his head. D what I said before? Times two, times three, times infinity, David. Get out. David managed to flee to a neighbor's house where he collapsed down unconscious. Hospital scans revealed that shit hit him so hard it fractured the back of his skull. As the old saying goes, pots and pans can break my bones, but words will never harm me, or something like that. Yeah, I think it's roughly correct. <laughs> I don't know, Rick. It looks fake. Unfortunately, as is often the case with violent abusers, Kathy managed to convince her husband not to press charges. That is, I, I hate this. After their daughter, Melissa Ann, was born, David finally decided he had enough. He left his abusive wife for another woman and moved up north to Queensland, a full day's drive away. He wisely made sure that nobody told his knife-loving, pan-wielding missus his new address. Ah, uh, Kathy took it about as well as you might expect. Please tell me he took the daughter. We don't. It doesn't say whether the daughter went with him. But I bloody well hope so. A troubled childhood. In a sense, Kathy Knight's violent tendencies weren't her fault. She was just a product of a pretty traumatic childhood. Again, it's like, yeah, of course, traumatic childhood. What a surprise. The crazy person, the psycho killer, in today's video, was abused in some way as a child. Don't abuse your kids. <laughs> Important lesson, because it fucks them up really badly. But also, you have to take some ownership. It doesn't matter how bad... You, I mean, of course, it matters how bad your childhood was and all of this stuff, but it's not an excuse for, like, this sort of behavior. Born on the 24th of October 1955 in the town of Tenterfield, just minutes after her twin sister, her life was wrapped up in controversy from day one. Her mother, Barbara, had left her husband to be with the father, a severe alcoholic, even by Australian standards, named Ken Knight. This caused a major scandal in the small conservative town, especially since the two lovers had met through Barbara's husband, the father to her four sons. The lovers ran away from all of that small town gossip and settled down in Aberdeen, another tiny town with just 1,000 500 inhabitants. There, Ken found work at the local slaughterhouse. <laughs> Why is it with all these people and the connections to abattoirs? Unfortunately, running off with Ken Knight turned out to be a mistake. He was extremely abusive and would regularly beat and rape Barbara up to 10 times a day. What the f? The couple had two more children together, making a total of four with Catherine and her twin sister. All of them witnessed the horrific physical and sexual violence inflicted on their mother, and with nobody else to confide in, she would often reveal some of the worst details to little Catherine and her sister. When tending to her cuts and bruises, Barbara would tell her twin daughters all about how disgusting and brutal men are, and how they're incapable of being kind or faithful. According to Catherine herself, she experienced this firsthand, often finding herself the victim of similar violence from male relatives. This is, I mean, yeah, just don't do it. Just don't do it. Needless to say, she didn't grow up with a particularly healthy view of love and relationships. Baby on the train tracks. So, when husband David left her in 1976, Cassie wasn't able to process the pain. She suffered what looked like a severe mental break. The day after her husband ran off, a local spotted her walking down the high street with her newborn in a pram. Oh no, he didn't take the kids. My dude, you gotta take the kids away from your crazy wife. I don't know what Australian law would say on this, but sh oh wait, he didn't go to the police about the frying pan thing. So, I, I don't know, I assume... 70s even today do they favor the mother in something like that i kind of feel they must like newborn needs breast milk needs the mother's love more like i have a kid and now it feels way more balanced between like how much the kid needs me and my wife still the kid needs my wife more just there's more of an attachment there like the mother child thing but like every month that goes by it just feels like way more equal but like in those early days is that I'm just kind of a support <laughs> as a dad. I felt more just like, what do I do? I support this these these two people who are working together. As like, okay, <laughs> so I guess at the beginning you gotta favor the mother, even if she no. In this case, please figure it out and get that kid away from that woman. She was shaking it from side to side violently while little baby Melissa wailed inside. For that very 
reason. Later that day, the police arrived at her house to arrest her for endangering her infant daughter. Good. Kathy was admitted to St. Elmo's Hospital and diagnosed with postnatal depression. After just a few weeks' treatment, she was released. As good as new. <laughs> she wasn't. She definitely wasn't. The loving mother was reunited with her daughter, who proceeded to dump her on a railway line just minutes before a train was due. I don't understand this. I just... I... Again, let's... I feel like we're talking about Simon as a dad a lot this episode. But I used to... You know... You're just... Your, your feelings... I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But my feelings about, like, babies and kids and stuff totally changed when I had them. I'm like, they're just these, like, perfect, innocent little creatures. And it's like the idea that this was something that people would do or someone would do just just seems of all the things we cover on casual criminalist it just seems almost beyond the most insane of all of them i don't understand thankfully a local forager known as old ted spotted uh, the pram on the tracks and managed to save the two-month-old with just moments to spare at the time the doting mother was off wandering the high street threatening people with a stolen axe kathy was admitted to a mental ward again but somehow got deemed sane what are we doing australian mental health and signed herself out the very next day that is insane that is insane no attempted murder charges no cps intervention she was just allowed to walk free as if she hadn't tried to dispose of her daughter like an old cowboy film villain this time kathy decided that taking out her pain on the little one wasn't necessary she had to hunt down the man who broke her heart later that week she grabbed one of her co-workers at the abattoir and slashed her face the terrified woman was forced to go on an impromptu road trip to queensland so kathy could track down and stab her awol husband which sounds like a great bot plot for a buddy movie but a pretty harrowing experience in real life yet yeah, she basically kidnapped this woman to drive her out a day's drive north to queensland so she could stab her husband this is crazy Somewhere along the way, the duo pulled into a motorway service station. The hostage managed to make a break for it. By the time she returned with help, Kathy had already found a replacement. <laughs> Kathy, mate, you need to go to prison. Like, please, can we just get on, get on it, and send her to prison as soon as possible? Because if this, if it gets, uh, Callum said in the introduction, that it gets like stomach churningly worse, even for true crime. This is already just madness, absolute madness. Madness. This is the casual criminalist. The police arrived to find her holding a young mechanic with a knife to his neck. News reports say that the cops then attacked her with brooms. <laughs> okay, Australia. <laughs> What's up with that? To knock the knife out of her hand, which suggests some pretty severe funding issues in the New South Wales police force. Yes. After being tackled to the grounds and arrested, Kathy was shipped off to Morissette Psychological Hospital to finally get the help she needed. Borderline personality disorder was added to her record. But she checked out the next day. If she checks out the next day and doesn't have a kid taken away from her, I'm going to be extremely disappointed with 1970s Australian mental health. I get the feeling I'm about to be severely disappointed. Let's hope not. Oh, did I mention that I've never read these before? Did I introduce the show appropriately today? Callum writes it. I've not read it. That's that's the shtick here. Welcome. Why am I doing the introduction now, Simon? Get on with your show. She later told nurses that her plan was to kill David, his mother, and also the mechanic whose only crime was fixing the fugitive husband's car on the drive up north. That's a coincidence. Things got even sadder from here because when the news of Kathy's complete mental breakdown reached David up in Queensland, he couldn't help but feel guilty for the psychological state of his would-be assassin. He ended up breaking off the relationship with his new partner and moving back down south with his mother to look after Kathy. David, there is, I mean, I want to say that you have like the goldenest of golden hearts of gold, but I also just think that you might be a bit mad. <laughs> so the Abbey family tried to start over in Brisbane and even all Australian place names are so weird. It is Brisbane, right? It's not Brisbane. And it's also Melbourne, not Melbourne, which is very confusing, Australia. Why do you have to do this to me? And even brought another child into that toxic environment in 1983. Oh my god. I guess Kathy must have pinky promised to not throw this one in front of public transport. To add insult to injury, David's self-destructive dedication wasn't enough for Kathy in the end. The very next year, she left him and returned to Aberdeen with their two children. She returned to work at the only place she ever felt fully content the Aberdeen slaughterhouse. There she could vent all of her inner frustration and torment by slicing the skin off cattle and hacking pig carcasses to pieces. By all accounts, she was pretty damn good at it. Mmm, mmm, mmm. That is so... Everything... I guess, like, you look at this woman 
and to record and to mental health in retrospect. And it's very easy to put it together because Callum has put it all together for me. But if you look at them as kind of like separate incidents being investigated by different police departments and different people, and then it's like, oh, she works at a slaughterhouse. Okay, you don't think about it more. But when you're like, yeah, 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 she slashes, she, she, she loves slicing the pig, the skin off cows. It all puts together a bigger profile, which I guess when you're not looking at it in retrospect, you don't see. But I feel like there should be more that is seen. Anyway, Queen of the Abattoir. In 1970, Kathy had left school with barely any qualifications. At 15 years old, she was unable to read or write. Most of the teacher and pupils were glad to see her go, since her time in education was about as stable as her future marriages. Kathy was infamous for gleefully bullying the smaller children, and once even attacked a young boy with a knife during lunch break. Wine cakes, cake spells. <laughs> knife attacks, I feel like, are expulsionate offenses. I'm pretty sure if you just brought a knife to school, uh, where I went to school, they'd suspend you. Although, maybe not a pen knife, but like if you brought a proper knife to school, it's gonna be, oh, what are you up to? Get out. The violent outcast even got into an altercation with a teacher at one point and was later ruled that this fully grown adult was actually acting in self defense against the blade wielding teen. That kind of track record usually doesn't sit too well with HR departments, but Kathy was lucky that Aberdeen's biggest employer was in constant need of young people with a talent and passion for knives. If I'm the HR person at an abattoir, I'm not asking about a passion for knives. Because I don't want people with passion for knives, even if you have to work with knives. I want skill with a knife. But then I want you to be able to put that knife away at the end of the day and not hang it above your marital bed. All right, Kathy? Twelve months after dropping out, she was working what she called her dream job, mopping up blood and guts at the Aberdeen, Ab Aberdeen Abattoir. On the hottest summer days, you could smell the acrid stench wafting through the entire town, but Kathy was never happier than when deep in the blood-soaked halls. Despite a deep-seated resentment for her abusive father, she still idolized him for his work in the abattoir and was thrilled to follow in his footsteps. I mean, okay, whatever, whatever floats your boat. As an independent event, I'll just be like, I mean, it's not for me, but whatever. But tied in with all the other stuff, it's just, it just paints a darker picture, doesn't it? After a few months cleaning up and heaving around carcasses for disposal, the management were impressed with their enthusiasm. Although in slaughterhouse work, surely there's a thing as too much enthusiasm. Yes, Callum, absolutely agree. Kathy was promoted to deboning the livestock and received her very first set of professional abattoir knives. You see, in my mind, I guess I thought this was a butcher's job to kind of take the bones out, but I guess like the prep work happens in an abattoir like taking the skin off like doing that slice hanging it up on a hook and all of that i have no idea i mean it's like a statement of the modern world isn't it like i have no idea how animals are killed i just i i love meat <laughs> it's so bad like i i do also feel that meat is going to be one of those things we look back on in 100 years and be like we really ate the flesh of we killed animals we like brought up hundreds of thousands millions billions in the case of chickens i believe of animals to kill them and eat their flesh that's kind of barbaric isn't it i mean i i yeah yeah it, it kind of it kind of is i do think that's not going to be that's not going to be brilliant when we look back on it in the future but i don't know meats meats tasty though isn't it <laughs> Let's try and not solve these ethical conundrums in the middle of a podcast episode, Simon, and get back to the facts. She was so proud of her new blades that she decided to take them every home every evening for cleaning and maintenance. Another huge red flag, surely. After sharpening and polishing the blades, she always hung them above her bed. That is a bigger red flag. I'm like, okay, so you're taking care of your work implements. Fine. Hanging them above the bed? A little bit more weird. She said they would always be handy if I needed them. You know, just in case you got the overwhelming urge to do some domestic slaughtering. At this point, there's about a 60% overlap between the biographies of Catherine Knight and Leatherface. But at this point, <laughs> but at this time, people never saw this hardworking teenage butcher as a threat. One of her old co-workers remembered her as a kind-hearted, bubbly girl who didn't warrant a second glance if you passed her on the street. That duality was her greatest asset. Kathy could be warm and charming enough to put people at ease, then flip in a matter of seconds. All of her loved ones were aware of this deeply disturbed dark side to her personality, but none of them suspected how far she would eventually go. Really? I mean, it seems like a pretty linear path so far. Oh, like, not linear. But she's been upping the ante, hasn't she? She's definitely been upping the ante. <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. And then, then she reached her limit and that was it. The baby on the tracks, the kidnapping uh, um, co-worker to drive her a day's north to stab her husband. 
I feel like, you know, if you looked at that graph of like crime, you'd be like, I wonder what's next. It's either more crime or less crime. It's more crime. It's definitely more crimes. Bringing the slaughterhouse home. The stress relief outlet that the slaughterhouse offered Kathy was snatched away when she sustained a back injury at work in the mid 80s and had to retire prematurely. Now surviving on a disability pension, she received government help to land a family home in Aberdeen for herself and her two daughters. She decked out their new house in her own particular style. Oh god, it's gonna be like, oh, what's that? Yeah, it's abattoir chic. Oh, oh, lovely. Every inch and wall of ceiling was covered with serial killer-esque paraphernalia, such as animal bones, animal hides, rusted animal traps, knives, and pitchforks. I mean, I get like animal bones and animal hides, because if you're really into hunting, I guess you can have that, but rusted animal traps? <laughs> that is weird. If Kathy couldn't go to the slaughterhouse, then she'd br just bring the slaughterhouse to her, in more ways than one foreshadowing there perhaps soon after the move she met a new love interest na named david saunders imagine going around to your girlfriend's place for the first time and seeing a horde of cow skulls staring, staring down at you from the bedroom wall i doubt anyone's gonna manage three rounds with that audience looking on more than three rounds three rounds was very unsatisfactory to her but somehow saunders wasn't put off by all the disturbing decor not even by the knives above the bed the two ended up getting married and he moved in with a family in 1987 just in case he ever needed Needed an out, he decided to keep the apartment where he used to live alone, which didn't sit right with Kathy. Just like before, she was convinced that her new husband was having an affair. I'll be like, no, 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 that I'm not having an affair. That's just where I'm gonna live when you get too crazy. Okay, okay. <laughs> What she needed was to send a clear signal. This is what will happen to you if you mess around behind my back. After a particularly violent argument, Kathy walked out to the back garden and grabbed Saunders's eight-week-old dingo puppy. He watched as she slit the little dog's throat just to prove she was callous enough to do it. Again, I don't understand. Like At this point, you'd be like, I'm out. That's it. I'm out. Like That is so psycho insane. You'd be like, no. No, nah, that, that was it. That was just, you know. <laughs> File those divorce papers, baby. Amazingly, this wasn't the end for their relationship. The two even had a daughter together in 1988. David Saunders only reached his breaking point after Kathy came within an inch of ending his life. After a night of drinking with his friends, he opened the front door to an iron in the face. When he was still dazed, Kathy stabbed a pair of scissors into his stomach. Please tell me this is where she serves some time. Please, please, Australia. Come on, Australia, don't let me down. Mate, these little murderous ambushes were her little way of showing how much she cared. <laughs> how sweet. Saunders had to leave his job and hide in another town to escape her, and when he returned after seven months to visit his daughter, the police told him that Kathy had taken out the, uh, the AVO, apprehended violence order, on him. What is going on? That is not right. I guess it's a, I guess that's kind of a good way to like preempt it because they'd be like wait Australia police she's the crazy one is that like, oh, yeah, so why did she come to the police first I mean it's a dumb argument but uh I can see why it might be sort of halfway resembling something effective the final days of john pricey price following saunders's well-timed departure kathy embarked on a new romantic adventure by far the most stable of her life this time it was the turn of an older man named john chillingworth who had worked with her at the abattoir for years chillingworth has admitted that he did see kathy's bad side but he never felt threatened the two had a son together in 1991 and stayed together for another two years then approaching christmas 1993 chillingworth discovered that kathy was having an affair he broke the relationship off and kathy decided to move in with her secret lover our missing man from the start of the episode mr john price he was a hard-working well-liked guy with the iconic permed mullet of a classic aussie blokes bloke i am also quite surprised this woman has had so many husbands and so many kids and has affairs on the sides by someone who quote didn't warrant a second glance if you passed her on the street and also she's like she's got those knives on the walls those cow skulls she works in an abattoir and loves that shit. i mean it's kind of surprising isn't it by now you've seen exactly what kathy was capable of and it was no secret around town back then either but somehow pricey must have seen something in this 38 year old mother of four with a long record of almost killing her lovers a house like a serial killer's shack and on a healthy obsession with knives I exactly like i just said not exactly my type but to each his own yes gallon john was a miner with a pretty hefty salary and a comfortable lifestyle 
He lived with his two teenage kids from a previous relationship. Kathy had her own little ones who got on well with a lot of them at first, but things soon turned sour after John revealed that he wasn't particularly interested in getting married again. Both of them were middle-aged, and he just didn't see much point. After that, Kathy's bad side came out in full force. Not long after they moved in together in 1995, John was called into his supervisor's office, supervisor's office and asked to take a seat. Oh god, what has she done? She's gone to them saying that he abused her or something? I don't know. Management presented him with a video from inside his own home showing what appeared to be stolen company property, medicine kits stashed inside one cupboard. John pled with them that he never stole the kits, they were just out of date ones that had salvaged from the trash. What is going on? Well, one, why would the. Okay, that seems a bit weird that he's taking these. Fine, can excuse that. But who sent the video? Why would his wife betray him? Because they're going to be sharing that money that he's making, right? It doesn't make sense. But then, Simon, why are you trying to make sense of the crazy people? They're crazy. That's their thing. But there was nothing he could do to convince them. Despite working there for 17 years, he was fired on the spot. That is outrageous. Take that to tribunal. Come on. And there was no doubt who had sent the video. This was Kathy's revenge for the lack of ring on her finger. Well, how do you think it's going to go now, Kathy? John quite rightly kicked her out as soon as he got home, but just a few months later, they started dating again. John, is this Kathy woman who doesn't get a second look on the street and loves working out so irresistible? I don't know, Rick. It looks fake. I, I mean, maybe that comment about not looking twice on the street was like, not what I'm interpreting it as, like, as her not being particularly good looking. But... I mean, because I'm just saying that because her personality is obviously not a winner, is it? So I'm assuming you'd be like, if she was outrageously good looking, I mean, it's like men are going to men. So, OK, but like, what is going on? Uh, he kept her at an arm's length, refusing to let her move back in for the time being. Most of his friends were livid that he kept seeing her and refused to talk to him while he stayed with this ritual abuser. Good friends. I mean, <laughs> good friends are bad friends. It's like, yeah, you know, you're not supporting me. It's like, yeah, dude, I'll support you. This is what you have to do. Leave your crazy girlfriends. And I don't just mean that like, I just don't not, I just don't like her. It's like, she, she's crazy. <laughs> On the other hand, Kathy wouldn't be satisfied until she could start playing Happy Families again and the two were joined in holy matrimony. So their arguments became even more frequent and explosive. Every time John ran in terror from her, she would shower him with apologies and guilt tripping him his coming back. Although it doesn't seem too hard to get him back because he came back after that, after he got, she got him fired. What is going on? Things went on like this for years. Oh, that's depressing. The couple would get together and break up over and over again until Kathy decided she'd had enough. It was time for an ultimatum. In 1999, Catherine Knight told her own daughter, I told him if he took me back, this time it was to the death. If I kill Pricey, I'll kill myself after it. Which incidentally brings us right back to that chilly March morning in the year 2000 when Pricey's neighbor and co-worker stood on his front doorstep, hearts racing as they noticed the dark stain of blood on the handle. Throughout the month prior, John had been coming into work with fresh cuts and bruises. His partner's assaults were growing ever more brutal by the day. Oh my god, that thing like, yeah, yeah, if I don't come in, my wife killed me. Now my joke in the beginning got a whole lot more like, oh my god, this is, this is crazy. <laughs> The weekend prior, she ended up stabbing him in the chest while their kids sit in the bedroom terrified. On February the 29th, he took a detour to Scone Magistrate's Court to take out a restraining order. His co-workers tried to convince him not to go back home that day, but John was terrified of what might happen to his kids if he didn't. Good for you, John. You gotta go back there and get those kids out. He had no idea that Kathy had already sent them off to a relative in preparation for the very special evening that she had in mind. Oh, this is so unfortunate because John did the right thing. Ah, uh, ah, uh, he should have gone with the police. He should have been, please, police, can you come with me to get my kids? Because I did this restraining order because she stabbed me in the goddamn chest. The police would be like, yeah, mate, no worries. We can do that. The worst Australian accent ever. Entering the hellhole. Police officers Matthews and Furlinger uh, responded to the call that morning and arrived at the Price House just after 8.10 a.m. The two men waiting in the front garden pointed out the blood on the handle and explained their suspicions that the home about the homeowner's famously unstable girlfriend. So the cops went round to the back of the house and kicked the back door in. In the dim light of the dingy hallway, Officer Matthews made out what appeared to be a piece of cloth hanging from the roof. There was something hanging, blocking my entry. I thought it looked like some type of blanket. I used my left hand to push it aside, and I remember feeling coldness. I looked down my left arm, and it was covered in blood. 
I couldn't understand why my arm was bleeding. Is this going to be some sort of like animal carcass or something that she brought home from the abattoir? Uh, or worse? But it wasn't his blood. That was when Matthews registered the tra strange texture of the blanket against his arm and the scarlet purple glistening on the floor and the eye holes. Oh god, it's she used her butchering skills to remove his skin, didn't she? Oh my god, dude. Callum, you were right. This gets horrible. If that's what happens. The blanket he had just pushed to the side was actually the skin of John Price. Well, I called it. Removed in one complete pelt, still slick with blood. It hung from a meat hook affixed to the roof of the hallway. The officers were expecting a routine domestic violence call, perhaps a murder at worst. What they weren't expecting, however, was to be tossed headfirst into a silent hill level. I saw a torso on the ground without a head, without any genitalia, recounted Matthews. This skinned and dismembered body of 44-year-old Pricey had been stabbed 37 times, deep wounds puncturing into the lungs, liver, kidneys, and severing the aorta. This left a vast puddle of blood on the lounge floor where it was found. The body had been butchered by an expert hand, by someone who knew how to remove the entirety of the skin from head, face, nose, ears, torso, neck, genital organs, and legs in one piece. Le le le. I mean, there wasn't any doubt that it was Kathy. And now it's like, well, I wonder who this could be. <laughs> could it be his girlfriend who worked at the abattoir and was extremely skilled with knives and who loved with a passion her job of removing skin? <laughs> Holy sh! But the worst sight was in the kitchen. Oh my god! What did they she do with his like muscle, like with the? Oh, oh I don't want to even know. I don't. I don't even know if I really want to continue. Holy sh! On the stove top. Oh, Callum, how do you make it just gets worse? On the stove top was a large soup pot with the skinned head of John Price bobbing around in a bloody mixture among potatoes and cabbage. Compared to that horror show, the dining room was actually quite presentable. The table was set for dinner, two plates sat on the tabletop, steak and a side of vegetables on each. Next to them were pieces of paper, folded notes with the names of John's children written on them, marking out where they were supposed to sit. As you probably guessed, the meat served up that morning was actually the flesh of the victim himself, cut from his buttocks. It seemed as if the killer planned on feeding him to his own kids. Uh, yeah, except when they see his skin hanging from the hallway ceiling, they're going to be like, uh, yeah, stepmom, what, what is this? <laughs> what is going on? Like, who? What, what's this meat? Is this lamb? And there, lying catatonic on the lounge floor, was the culprit. After brutally killing, butchering, and skinning her partner, Catherine Knight had taken a cocktail of pills and an apparent suicide attempt. She lay there, unresponsive, and was taken off to hospital in an ambulance. Detectives then went about the unhappy task of piecing together a cohesive narrative from the piles of gore in the worst crime scene of their careers by far. The Timeline Detective Bob Wells was the lead investigator on the case and the one who was scheduled to interrogate Kathy once she had been stabilized in the hospital ICU. Until then, he was able to build a clear enough picture of what had happened that night based on the physical evidence alone. The mattress in the master bedroom was sodden with blood, indicating that Kathy had set upon the victim while he lay in bed. Trails of blood and footprints leading down the hallway showed that he must have woken up screaming and made a break for the front door. Blood splatters covering the walls revealed how she chased after him, stabbing the blade into his back and sides as he fled. John had actually managed to make it outside the house, as proven by the blood on the door handle, but by that point, he was well on his way to bleeding out. By the time he made it onto the front step, he was too weak to resist. Kathy grabbed him with all her strength and dragged him back inside to finish the job. In the hallway behind the front door, a drying puddle of blood stretched out almost two meters wide, signaling where John Price's life had ended. Drag patterns smeared in blood showed how Kathy had then heaved the corpse through to the lounge, where she used her years of abattoir experience to ex expertly remove his skin in one complete piece good lord this is this is definitely one of the worst ones so far isn't it the butcher's knife she then used to hack him to pieces was still sitting there beside the dismembered beheaded remains after taking off the skin and hanging it to dry she chopped up the body with an expert hand just like she had done to thousands of cattle in the past she cooked the human steaks first then boiled the vegetables in the pot with the victim's flayed head the temperature of the broth was still between 40 and 50 degrees celsius meaning that all of this probably happened in the very early hours in the morning probably a pretty rough day for the csi technician that to log that had to log the temperature of that horror show sometime after processing the body like a hunk of fresh beef kathy arranged the body in a pose that prosecutors believe intended to humiliate price she crossed his legs and placed his arm over an empty plastic drink bottle on top of a picture of price she laid a barely understandable handwritten note 
time you got back jonathan for rapping raping my daughter daughter you to beck price's daughter for ross for little john his son now play with little john's d john price no evidence was ever found to back up these claims of abuse before he went inside detective wells was told by responding officers that it was too much for them to handle even after that he was shocked at the blood-soaked brutality of the scene in all his 20 years on the job he hadn't seen anything like it one of the fingerprint technicians actually handed in his resignation the very next day after placing up the man's flesh for his kids it looked like kathy had cooked herself a portion of the meal for herself that ended up tossed out in the back garden it's thought she tried to eat this part herself but couldn't go through with it slaughtering and butchering a loved one must have ruined her appetite after that she decided to end her own life perhaps premeditatively or perhaps after an unexpected pang of regret either way she went to the medicine cabinet and grabbed all of the medication that she could find she then lay dying a slow and painful death for hours until the police broke down the back door and found her there for a while it looked like she might have succeeded in ending things but after three days in hospital she was dragged back into the world of the living to answer for herself detective wells visited her on the ward for her first interrogation just like every other time she had inflicted horrible violence on a partner she had swung back towards the nicer side of her personality hardly the hellraiser demon that detective wells was expecting in fact she was quite compliant from the outset she explains that on the night of february 28th she went over to john's house at 11 p.m hoping to surprise him she let herself in with a spare key and sat watching tv for a while before jumping in the shower it was a hot night so the sound of the ac in the bedroom meant john was still asleep when she opened the bedroom door she claimed that she had slipped into a new piece of lingerie and woken the victim up he wanted sex so he had it he was gentle and kind afterwards he went to the toilet he was walking back to the bed and that's it that's it that's all she remembered none of the murdering butchering flaying or any of that fun stuff she claimed that she blacked out for the entire episode but detective wells could sense she wasn't telling the truth quote you interview a lot of people and you'll catch someone's eye and you'll know this person has just bullshitted me and that's how i felt about that interview if she wants to take it to the grave with her well so be it never to be released now the prosecution definitely didn't need a confession to prove the crime seeing as kathy was all but bathing in the victim's blood when the cops arrived the only question remaining was all the charges she should be sent down on proving that this killer was mentally competent to even convict was a whole other story through interviews with her family members detectives learned that she seemed to have planned it this way all along it wasn't only her daughter that she told about her plans to kill pricey but her brother too ah here we are again catch your criminalist don't write down your crime don't tell other people about your crimes the two simple rules guys just don't do it I mean or do do it so we can catch you and send you to prison for being a horrible criminal in 1999 she said to him I'm going to kill pricey and the two kids too I'm going to get away with it I'll get away with it because I'll make out I'm mad uh oh remember this is a woman who once tried to leave her newborn on some train tracks and only served one day in a mental hospital as a result as far as she was concerned the insanity card was as good as total immunity she offered to plead guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility which carries a comparatively light sentence down under but unfortunately for the Aberdeen butcher the evidence didn't quite add up with her story the precise expertise with which she skinned her lover didn't suggest a woman acting crazed or irrational as judge new south wales supreme court justice o'keefe said the flaying was quote so expertly done after the post-mortem examination the skin was able to be re-sewn onto price's body in a way which indicated a clear and appropriate albeit grisly methodology oh my god i understand like you're burying him whole or whatever like sewing his skin back on whoever's whoever had that job i do not envy you in any way whatsoever that is i don't want to think about that anymore there's all sorts of there's weird glove analogies i could use that came to my mind but let's just move on immediately yes before the funeral they were actually able to wrap the skin back onto the murdered man as if they were putting the packaging back on a piece of meat well gallons with those uh yeah with those analogies good as new if that image is making you uncomfortable yes consider the alternative what the hell did kathy plan on doing with the human pelt once it dried maybe she was planning on taking a leaf from the ed Gein handicrafts handbook the psychiatrists on the case never brought the insanity plea either when the trial commenced in october 2001 one of them told the court the problem is not that she did not know it was wrong to do such things but that she didn't care about doing them callousness is not an absence of knowledge of what is right or wrong 
As anyone who ever dated her knew, Kathy was just an exceptionally cruel individual, willing and capable to stab, bludgeon, and terrorize the people closest to her. And as soon as you start killing puppies, you lost any chance of sympathy from the internet mob. Yeah, 100%. Like, I, no one had any sympathy at any point for her. I mean, maybe when we heard about her abusive childhood, but because Callum led off with, like, she's going to do some horrible shit that we're all going to hate, the the sympathy even then was like, yeah, 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 she had a rough childhood. Doesn't mean she has to, be, you know, grow up to be someone who removes people's skin and turns it into a rug. It's weird. Stop it. The defendant stuck to her amnesia story and pled not guilty, but shortly after the trial began, she must have seen it was a lost cause and switched her plea. The trial was adjourned before the first witness even took the stand. Justice O'Keefe wrapped up the sentencing by saying, The last minutes of his life must have been a time of abject terror for him, as they were a time of utter enjoyment for her. The only appropriate penalty for the prisoner is life imprisonment and that parole should never be considered for her. And just like that, Catherine Knight, Aberdeen's very own horror movie monster, became the first woman to ever be sentenced to life without parole in Australia. She was transferred to Silverwater Prison and her papers marked with the words, never to be released. Wrap up. Where is she now? And she never has been. Excellent. Kathy Knight appealed her sentence once back in 2006, but was denied. She still dreams of overturning the no parole ruling and walking free again. Whether or not the community will ever allow it is another question entirely. Despite the undeniable tragedy of the start of her life, Kathy's adulthood was a parade of abject horror as she became more and more deeply disturbed. Apparently, though, she's managed to turn things around a bit behind bars. Back in 2020, John Chillingworth, Kathy's third partner and the only one she wasn't able to dominate, revealed that he still goes to visit her in prison. How does this woman do it? To hear him tell it, she no longer possesses a risk to society. She does pottery class and she's pretty good at it. She likes painting. She seems to be calmer and mixes with the other girls. It's like a big dormitory, but she gets on with everyone. They call her grandma. Oh, how sweet. Except this grandma's secret soup recipe had just a tad too much human remains for my tastes. And karma is a relative term, so long as she's not stabbing and skinning people, she's obviously making some progress. It's doubtful that any judge will ever buy that Kathy is reformed enough to be re reintroduced into society. Good, she shouldn't be. The images of what she did to John Price haunt the officers who wandered into that terrifying alternate dimension back in 2000. Detective Wells retired 10 years after, but because of this case and a few more bad ones, he still needs weak counseling. My diagnosis was severe chronic post-traumatic stress disorder (PTSD). It's not going to get any better, but you just need to keep on top of it. It doesn't matter how strong your stomach is or how many times you've listened to true crime episodes describing horrific scenes, nothing can quite prepare you for seeing a man skinned and served for dinner. I guess for Kathy it was no big deal. After years spent hacking up carcasses in the slaughterhouse, it was all just meat to her in the end. And Callum says here, optional part here for social responsibility and all that. Well, I like some responsibility, social responsibility, so let's just give it a read. One last thing before we finish up today. I think it's really worth noting that the significance of, do uh, the significance of domestic violence in this story and the importance of condemning it no matter which way it goes. An angry wife cracking a frying pan over her drunk husband's head is often treated like a bit of harmless slapstick on old TV shows, but the reality is that Kathy was cracking skulls and that's no laughing matter. Yeah, I really think, I mean, I don't think we're fully there yet, but I do think our society has moved on from the point of just thinking that domestic violence is something that men do to women, but it's also something that men can, uh, women can do to men. I, I like to think we're more there, obviously. I imagine it's still super un underreported, like all domestic violence is. But I don't know, it's uh, it's complicated, as all of these things are, but it's, it's got to be hard to go to the police I mean, it's got to be hard. To, I don't want to diminish the difficulty of a woman going to the police to report domestic violence but and say that it's harder for a man. But I, I'd feel like less of a, even though you shouldn't, it'd be feel like a bit of a less of a man to have to report to the police that your wife is domestically abusing, even though domestic abuse goes beyond physical abuse. It's just, yeah, I don't know, just my personal opinion. I obviously don't have any stats or anything to back that up, but it's... Uh, yeah, it's a mess. This uh, domestic abuse is, yeah, just never right in any way. We've seen examples of abuse in many forms today, including some of the subtler emotional manipulation used to trap victims long term. At the end of the day, abuse is abuse and should be treated as such. If you or anyone know a man, woman, child, dog or cat or other might be in a situation like the one we've described today or less, we'll drop some resources in the description which can help. Yes, actually, I'll really read a couple now. Um... 
UK, country specific info and contacts here, UK men, because I know not everyone reads the description, especially on podcasts, uh, is mensadviceline.org.uk is a good one. In Australia, it's mensline.org.au. Uh, US men and women, the hotline.org, and Canadian men and women, Dawn Canada, D A W N Canada.net forward slash issues forward slash crisis hyphen hotlines. Um, so, yeah, uh, hopefully those links. Obviously, I know it's just a few countries there, but Google is your friend. And yeah, I, I'm glad we included that social responsibility bit. Dismembered appendices. Number one, despite growing up in a pretty terrible family environment, there was one person who Kathy really could rely on her uncle, Oscar Knight, a champion equestrian. After he killed himself in 1969, Kathy swore that his ghost would regularly visit her, even after she was imprisoned. And number two, the progression from slaughterhouse work to murderer might seem like a bit of a cliche, but according to Yale Global Health Review, it's a well deserved stereotype, oh, it is. The act of slaughtering hundreds of li living animals on an industrial scale can completely desensitize workers to violence, and many turn to drugs, alcohol, and even spouse abuse to work through the feelings those are not good ways to work through feelings if they already have trauma from personal abuse that this can often lead to murder you don't have to be a deranged psychopath to work there but apparently it certainly helps this has been another episode of the casual criminalist i do hope i'm not going to ask whether you enjoyed it it was possibly the most horrific one we've done so far although i feel like i've said that about a couple but the skinning people i mean at least they weren't alive i was going to say skinning alive but they weren't alive but it's still horrific uh if you did again i don't want to say enjoy but if you enjoy this podcast as a podcast and as a general thing use that like button below make sure you're subscribed if you're uh well if you're watching on youtube or as a podcast make sure you're subscribed also please leave us a review if you're listening as a, a as a podcast if your platform allows it i know spotify don't i don't know why it would be nice anyway this has been an episode of the casual criminalist i've been your host uh simon not callum callum wrote the script jen did the editing and sound work afterwards, video work if you're watching, and I will see you next time.